Thanks, Gash. All right, today uh, I'm going to be preaching on spirit, soul, and body. Uh, I was on winning last week and I got into a conversation where we were um, sort of discussing the difference between the spirit, soul, and the body. So I thought I would explain this to you today because some people don't know the difference. And um, if you do, it helps you to understand like the human nature and, and why things are the way they are. It helps you to understand some doctrines as well. So, you know, this sermon's going to kind of, you know, look under the hood of the human in terms of, you know, how these three interact and um, also the, how, they, how they change on the journey of a believer and an unbeliever in terms of salvation and things like that. So hopefully this is interesting for you if you haven't learnt this already, and this will be a good recap if you um, have sat through one of these sermons before where I've talked about this topic. So spirit, soul, and body. And, and you'll realise that, you know, some, sometimes these questions come up when, you know, when you talk to other religions, you know, either other Christian religions and um, even false Christian religions, because uh, some of them don't, you know, don't believe that there's a soul. Some people just believe there's a spirit in the body. So the Christadelphian that I was speaking to last week, like they, they don't believe that there's a soul. They just believe that when the spirit is with the body and you're alive, then you're classified as a soul. But when you're dead, then you're just no longer existing. Um, but I think it's a bit more complex than that. I think there are actually three parts to us, and, and the soul is not just when the spirit and the body are together. If that makes sense. So they just think when the spirit and the body are together, you're alive, you're referred to as a soul. But then when you're not alive, then the soul is no longer there, right? Like you, you don't no longer exist. But I don't believe that. I believe um, that we are a three-part being. And the reason why is I, I go to this verse in 1 Thessalonians 5. It says here, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you can see that the soul is something different to the spirit and the body. Uh, so how do these things interact? Now, I, I, don't, I don't believe that this spirit, soul, body makeup of us is what the Bible is referring to when it says we are made in God's image. And sometimes you'll hear people when they talk about the, you know, the abortion argument or the euthanasia argument where they say, well, you can't kill somebody because we're all made in God's image. And, and this idea that you know, men and women are, are both made in God's image. Well, I don't, I don't believe it's referring to this, even though this can be used as a loose analogy of the Trinity. You know, like a lot of people will use this analogy of, you know, a three-part being being one person. It's not, no, no analogy is perfect, but, you know, the reason is, is because the, the, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost are not three parts of one God, you know, because each one of them is all 100% God. So the Trinity is like 100%, 100%, 100% equals 100%, whereas this is like there are actually three parts that make up one person. So I don't believe this is what the Bible is referring to when it talks about being made in the image of God. I think the phrase being made in the image of God is, is simpler than we make it out to be. It's just the fact that man was made to look like God, right? So when God created man, he created him to look like him. Um, but, you know, woman was not created to look like man, right? Woman was created uh, from man's rib and, and looks different. And I'll show you a couple of verses there in Genesis 1.27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Do you see the sing singular term there? Male and female created he them. Right? So who was made in God's image? It was the man that was created in God's image, but God created man and woman in the beginning. 1 Corinthians 11, 7, For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of the man. So, so this idea that, so, so being made in the image of God is not about your worth as a human being. That's just how people use that phrase today. They say, oh, we're all made in the image of God. That's why we're all as valuable as each other. I'm just saying that that's, I don't think that's a biblical argument, right? We're all valuable because we're all humans, right? We're all creatures of God, right? But then in terms of being made in the image of God, all I'm saying is in the Bible, it's about looking like a man, right? But a woman doesn't look like a man. A woman looks like a woman. Um, and, and that's why she's not made in the image of God. Man is, right? So just a small correction there on that phrasing. Now, what's the difference? 
what's the difference between body, soul, and spirit? So if I was just give like a high-level explanation, and we'll go through the journey of body, soul, and spirit uh, in this sermon today. But basically, if we start at the soul, right? The soul is who you are. Right? So I was explaining to the children this morning, the soul is like you, your preferences. You know, it's who you are. You know, different people have different personalities, but it's not necessarily right or wrong. You know, some people are quieter, some people are louder, some people enjoy certain things, other things. Maybe you've got a favorite color is green, somebody else's is blue. You know, you have your own unique preferences and, and, and characteristics, right? That's you. And you'll notice that when you get saved, those, those preferences may not change. You know, you know your, your favorite color doesn't change when you go from being a non-Christian to a Christian, right? You may just have the same favorite color. So that's who you are, right? Now, you're, now, now you, you as a soul, that's what, what God creates. You know, he, he breathed into Adam, you know, the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So that's what's created, right? And then you have two other parts, is how you then interact with the world. So your body is how, and this is why I've got it this way, your body is how you interact with the physical world. Right? So if you think about it, when you interact with the physical world, you do that through the flesh, how you feel, the five senses, taste, touch, that's one aspect of the body. But the other aspect of the body, that is, that's what we inherited from Adam. Right? So we have, when we talk about the sinful flesh, right? that, that's what we inherited from Adam, and that's what gives us our nature to sin. Right? And then what's the spirit then? Well, if the body is how you interact with the physical world, your spirit is how you interact with the spiritual world. So you say, well, you can't see the spiritual world. You can't touch exactly, right? It's because you don't interact with it through your physical senses, right? But the spirit is how you interact with the spiritual world. Now, the closest we have in the physical world to the spirit, I believe, is the words that we hear to a certain extent. So you're, you're hearing the, the spirit, right? But that's what we hear the spirit, like Jesus talked about, like the spirit's like the wind, that you hear the sound thereof, but you can't see what's going on. So that's why the spirit is more than just the sound waves, right? The spirit are the words that you hear. That's why, you know, the Bible, when you say the word of God, the word of God is more than just the English language, right? It's more than just the words on the page. It's more than the sound waves just hitting your ear. And it's something else, right? It's those words that have those meanings. That's what the spirit is. And that's how your spirit is too. That's why when you, that's why words are a powerful thing. When you, you can encourage or discourage somebody, you can hurt somebody just by the things you say, right? Because that's how your spirit is rubbing off on somebody else, right? So this spiritual realm is this realm of information. It's this realm of words and your spirit and your words and your attitude, you can think about it, is what, how you interact with the spiritual realm. So praise, prayer, you know, uh, reading God's word, you know, memorizing God's words, preaching God's word. This is sp the spirit, right? So these are different. Now, I, I have it this way because I believe at the most fundamental level, this is where life comes from. Spirit is where life comes from, I believe. So the spirit is what gives the soul life. And when the soul is alive and in the body, that's what gives the body life. And then the body is what interacts with the world. So when I think of spirit, soul, body, this is what I'm thinking of. I'm thinking of concentric circles with the spirit at the very center, which is giving life to the soul. And as long as the spirit and soul are in the body, it gives life to the body. And then the body interacts with the world. The spirit interacts with the things of God and the things of the spirit with other people. Now the spirit and the soul are quite closely intertwined because obviously the soul can leave the body, like when you die. But I believe the spirit always stays with the soul, right? But the spirit dictates whether the soul is alive or not uh, in the spiritual sense. And why, why is that? This, this is an interesting passage that somebody brought to my attention a while back. Um, and now it makes sense to me when I think about this overall concept, right? So it says here, that For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So you see how it's saying that the word of God is like this sharp sword 
that it's so sharp that it's able to cut between soul and spirit. So that shows you that the, the connection between soul and spirit is, is very close. And this is why a lot of people, I think, you know, misunderstand. Like they think the spirit is the soul. The soul is what's the difference? Like a lot of people ask this question, right? So I'm trying to give you those answers today based on my study and based on what I've learned over the years. But notice here, it's like the difference between the joints and the marrow, right? So the marrow and the bones and the joints. So it's saying it's the difference between those, which is very closely intertwined. The difference between soul and spirit. But look at this. This is where it's interesting. The thoughts and intents of the heart. So what does the Bible do? The Bible, you know, the Bible talks about being like a mirror that you self-reflect on. And you can discern between what are your thoughts and what are your intents. Why? Because it's obviously the Bible tells you what's right and wrong. So a thought may be, like, so think about this, right? I'm just trying to apply it, and I'm, I'm going on the fly here a bit. But, you know, the thoughts might be, you know, well, I like the color pink. But then the intent might be, well, you know what? I may not wear this because I feel that it's a bit more feminine than masculine. Right? So you can see how the Bible, is, you can, you can, you can kind of divide between the difference between, okay, well, maybe a preference versus or a commandment versus what, what I think is right to do in a certain situation, what's modest. So this is why it's like that, right? This is why it's saying, hey, the word of God, it's powerful, it's sharper, and it can divide between soul and spirit. So you can see that the relationship between soul and spirit is a very close one, right? And that's why that's there. So let's talk about you know, how these things change over time when it comes to salvation and our creation and things like that. So the first step I want to talk about is spiritual creation. Spiritual creation. So just like Adam was created, God breathed into him the breath of life and he became a living soul. All of us, you know, we are, uh, we are spiritually created in a body where, you know, we inherit from Adam, right? Like obviously we're conceived of a, a sperm and an egg, but then what I believe is God creates the soul and then gives the soul life by breathing into him, you know, this spirit to give the, the soul life. So when we are born, and this is what people may not understand, when we are born, right? So this is a picture of like when we're born and just like, you know, the pink flesh, right, body. When we are born, we are born spiritually alive. We are not born spiritually dead. See, so some people believe that we are born spiritually dead because, you know, we inherit Adam's sinful nature. But there are different understandings of original sin, right? Now, the correct understanding, I'll just show you a few verses first. Psalm 51, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Right? So what is, that doesn't mean that his mother committed adultery, and that's how he was conceived. It's, no, he's, he's conceived in sin, meaning the, his sinful flesh, right, that we inherited from Adam. Ephesians 2, 3, look, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. So what does it mean to be by nature the children of wrath? Well, we, we inherit Adam's sinful nature. We inherit this tendency to sin, that if we do not attempt to do right, our, our, our body tends towards sin, like Adam's did, Right? But what we don't inherit it is Adam's guilt. Right? So Adam committed sin against God. You know, we are born of Adam's flesh, so we have this sin nature, but we don't inherit his guilt. Right? We are guilty of our own sins that we commit. We don't die because of Adam's sin. So that's why Adam was created spiritually alive. God said to him, In the day that thou eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. But remember when he ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He didn't die physically that day, but what did he die that day? He died spiritually. His spirit died, right? So he was alive spiritually. He died spiritually. So when we are born, we, don't, we aren't born spiritually dead. We are born spiritually alive because we don't inherit Adam's guilt. We just inherit his nature, right? Deuteronomy 24, 16, the father... Fathers shall not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. Okay? So this is why babies, you know, and also those that are just, you know, just mentally disabled and things like that, this is why when they die, they go to heaven. Because they're not actually spiritually dead. 
right? They, they haven't been held accountable for the sin. So they, they are born with a sinful flesh. Yes, babies do sin, right? Any parent knows that babies sin, but there's, a, there's an age at which they become accountable. But this is why they um, go to heaven, because they haven't actually died spiritually yet. 2 Samuel 12. This is the story of David's child that died. Then said his servants unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive. But when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat. So this is David fasting to try and save his child. He's begging God to not take his child's life because of the adultery he committed with Bathsheba. He said, While the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, Who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? So he's saying, Why should I fast now? Can I bring him back again? Look at this. I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. So you see how David knew that when his baby, his, uh, baby, uh, his, his son died, that he would go straight to heaven. Why is that? Because the spirit is still alive for children. Now look at what James 2 says. You say, look, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So I'm not focusing on this doctrine of work salvation. Um, but this phrase here, the body without the spirit is dead. So, see, that is still accurate, because you say, well, aren't you dead when the soul leaves the body? But remember, because the soul and the spirit are together, that's also accurate that when the spirit leaves the body, the body's going to be dead too. So if you think about it like this, this is if a believer dies, right? Or, so we're talking about a baby here. Like a ba if a baby dies, or let's say somebody who's like mentally disabled, so they're not necessarily held accountable for their sins, that's what I believe. So let's say they die, their body is now dead on the earth, but their spirit and soul immediately go to heaven. But you can see that the spirit is separate from the body, so the body's dead. Okay? So, uh, let's see if I've missed any points here. All right, so the soul leaves the body, it takes the spirit. So if the spirit's dead, the soul goes to hell, otherwise it goes to heaven. So this is what happens if a baby dies. Okay, or somebody that's not spiritually dead. All right? Now let's talk about what causes spiritual death. Well, we know it's sin, but there's a point in everyone's life where there's like an age of accountability. Now nobody knows what that age is, but at one point it happens. And we read Romans 7 this morning, and this is where it kind of alludes to this, this thought. Romans 7, 7, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. So you see how the knowledge of sin comes from the knowledge of the law. So there's this idea of understanding, right? Like people, when once a person gets to this age of understanding where they understand the law, they understand sin, they understand salvation, that's when they're held accountable for their sins. And that happens at quite an early age. I mean, we don't know. It's not the same age for everyone, but there's an age at which that happens. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. So the concupiscence is just like uncleanness. For without the law, sin was dead. So you see that? Without the law, sin was dead. So isn't that interesting that this is why a baby is still spiritually alive, but then yet they're still sinning. Right? Because they're sinning, but because they're ignorant, right? They don't have the knowledge of the law. The sin that they commit is what the Bible calls dead, right? It's not actually, it has not actually killed them spiritually. Verse 9 For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. So you see, Paul there is not talking about physically dying, right? He's saying, I was alive spiritually without the law once, referring to the fact that everyone is born spiritually alive. But when the commandment came, so now he understands the commandments, right? He understands, you know, when we, when we get that knowledge of the law, whatever age that is, sin revived and I died. So that's the point of spiritual death. And like I said, we don't have an exact age, but there's a, it's a point in everyone's life. And the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, 
working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. Okay? So how does that work with the diagram? This is how we are, born spiritually alive. You reach an age of accountability where you, un you have now an understanding of God's law of sin. And that's the same age, I think, where it's possible for somebody to understand salvation as well. They now die spiritually. All right? Now, do we condemn people without a knowledge of the law? Right? Well, this knowledge of the law comes to everyone. It's not only people that grow up in Christian circles and say, oh, they understood the Bible. We're talking about just the law of right and wrong. Romans 2.14, For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or, ex or else excusing one another. So, Everybody has the law of God written in their hearts. That's why there comes to an age where you just understand now. You don't have to be raised as a Christian. Right? You don't need to necessarily be taught the Bible. But this law of God, this, this, uh, this moral standard is, is built into everyone. And that's why even Gentiles, even nations that don't, don't necessarily know about Jesus Christ, know right from wrong. And it shows that when they govern themselves, you know, this is why even false religions, you know, people, when you over, uh, go and, uh, you know, preach the gospel to people, they say, oh, well, they're all similar. You know, yeah, well, we have similar moral standards, you know, you don't kill, don't lie, because that moral standard is built into everyone. But, you know, at that point, you know, when they learn about God and they learn about Jesus and things like that, um, there's, there's also the doctrine that, you know, everyone's heard of that too, where the, the word gets out. Anyways, I don't want to complicate that too much, because that's not what I'm preaching about today. So... If somebody, you were born on a spiritual life, they die spiritually when they're held accountable for their sins at that age of accountability. If they die without being born again, then when their soul leaves their body, because their spirit is dead, they will be in hell. Their body, dead body will be on earth. Okay? Now, number three is spiritual birth. Spiritual birth. So we know in order to be saved, we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. John 3, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh or whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. So when we believe on Jesus Christ, we are born again. Right, and what is it referring to? Now you know it's referring to that Spirit. That Spirit is born again. Ephesians 2, But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together, with Christ, by grace you're saved. Now you understand why the Bible refers to us as dead when we're not saved. Yes, the body is still alive because the soul is still in the body there. But because the spirit is dead, technically we're dead. Once the soul leaves the body, that's why it immediately goes to the place of death, hell. But when we're born again, we believe on Jesus Christ, our spirit is made alive again. We are quickened, which is what that word means, made alive. Us together with Christ, by grace you're saved and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Right, so we're born spiritually alive, age of accountability, you die. Now you believe on Jesus Christ. What happens? Your spirit is now born again. It's a new creature. But look, I want you to notice here, your soul does not change. And this is why you, you can understand the difference between the spirit and the soul, because when you're born again, you have a new spirit, right? Now this is where you have the mind of Christ and, you know, you have a, a, you know, a connection to, to God in terms of his word and, you know, that, that inner struggle between body and spirit, which we're going to look at in a moment. But the soul doesn't change. You know, that's why your personality doesn't necessarily change when you get saved. Right? And this is what's interesting, that salvation, your spirit 
changes. Your spirit dies, your spirit is born again, but your soul is the same. And that's why there are elements of you that are just you, that do not change, even though before you were an unbeliever and that now you're a believer. But now because of this dynamic, now there's this internal conflict, right, between the sinful flesh, this nature that we followed, right, and now the spirit to combat that. And that's what's alluded to also in Romans 7. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal. What does it mean, carnal? Carnal means fleshly, right? Body. Sold under sin. So you see how the spirit and flesh is working against one another. For that which I do, I allow not. So he's saying the things that he does, I usually don't permit them. For what I would, the things I want to do, that do I not. So I'm not doing the things that I want to do. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not. So he's saying, if I do the things that I don't want to do, I consent unto the law that it is good. Right? Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. So I think what he's referring to there is the soul, right? Like the soul, there's, there may be a willingness to want to do good, but there's no, because the spirit's dead, there's no ability to do good because there's only the sinful flesh to follow. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God. Look at this, after the inward man. Right? So the inward man is what? That spirit. But I see another law in my members, in my body, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So you see how he's alluding to this in his members. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? But he knows this deliverance is coming one day at the resurrection. Right? So this, but this is why there's this dynamic now. Because in him there's the will to want to do good. Right? But then he's, he's having this struggle. Now this dynamic is important to understand when we look at other verses in the Bible. And how we understand like you know, judging a person's salvation. Because Look, some people will say, oh, you know, well, if you're a Christian, you know, how, why do you still act like that? Well, now you understand. Because the, the flesh didn't disappear when you got saved, right? What, 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 got, what happened when you got saved is an, another element was added to resist what was already there. Do you see? But if you, the soul decides to walk in the flesh rather than the spirit, you're going to be the same person you were before, right? When you were spiritually dead. But now there's, there's an opposing force in there now. But now you can understand why people still have the same temptations, still maybe go back to their old ways, because there's this struggle happening now. Right? So 2 Corinthians 5, we want to understand a few of these verses in light of this. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away, behold, all things have become new. So see, people say, well, if you're a Christian, you're not going to do the old things anymore, because all things have become new. Well, what is this verse referring to? Is this verse referring to this whole picture? No, it's referring to this. It's saying this is the new creature there, but not this. This is still the old creature. This is where all things have become new, but not this. All things aren't new, right? Because you've got the old and the new. So this is why you have to understand that's what it's referring to. The new creature is that yellow bit. Here's some verses where it talks about these dynamic between the two. Ephesians 4, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, that's the flesh, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man. What's the new man? That's that spirit, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. We can understand the good trees and the bad tree as well. It's both internally within us. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, 
but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. So again, just remember, just picture that diagram in your head. You've got a good tree, bad tree. Yeah, the flesh can't have good fruit. Why do we have good fruit as Christians? Because we've got the Spirit, which is the good tree. 1 John 3, you're going to understand verses like this now if you understand this dynamic. He that committed sin is of the devil. What's that? It's the flesh, right? Because it was the devil that can sort of convince Adam into sinning, right? For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. So that's that yellow inner spirit, right? The Son of God. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. So that's the sinful flesh. Neither he that loveth not his brother. Why do we hate? Why do we sin? Because of the sinful flesh, right? That struggle. Galatians 5 says it very clearly as well. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that ye would. Romans 8. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Okay? So there's plenty of verses in the Bible that refer to this dynamic. And I think it's very important that we understand that this dynamic's there so that we don't start believing work salvation. You know, because some people, they, they get mixed up. They say like, oh, if you're a Christian, you're meant to be a new creature. You're meant to be the good tree. You're meant to have the new man. Why are you still like the old man? And, they just, and they're picturing this whole thing should be this. And that's not the case, right? What's actually the case is there's two, two elements now to you that are warring against one another. Now, finally, in the end, we will get a spiritual body, right? So right now we're living in the sinful flesh, but one day this flesh will be replaced by a spiritual body. And this is what's being alluded to in 1 Corinthians 15 when it talks about the resurrection. The resurrection, the first resurrection happens when Jesus comes back, right? And all of us who are saved take part in the first resurrection. Not everybody takes part in the first resurrection. Those that get saved after Jesus comes back, they, you know, wait in heaven. They don't get to, you know, enjoy the, the thousand-year reign. And there are people that will get saved through the thousand-year reign too. You know, they'll die just like others. But those of us who are saved prior to Jesus returning will be given this new body first. And then later on, those that believe, uh, you know, after that point will be resurrected at the white throne judgment and they'll get their new bodies there. And those that don't, it will be thrown into the lake of fire. So 1 Corinthians 15, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. So that's talking about our flesh being sown in corruption, sinful flesh. It is raised in incorruption. Why is it saying that? Because we're going to be given a new body, sinless. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body. And there is a spiritual body. So what's the spiritual body? That's the new body, the sinless body, the one that Jesus raised with when he rose again from the dead. Now, well, there's, what makes me wonder, though, and these are just all you know, thoughts when you, you read the Bible, you, you remember when Jesus rose again, he still had the prints of the holes in his hand and things like that. So I wonder whether there'll still be characteristics of your body in the new body <laughs> so that you're recognizable. You know what I mean? Maybe you still look the same. Maybe you still have characteristics. But who knows? Who knows? But you won't have all the pain and the suffering. Thank God for that. Yeah, there won't be any pain or suffering. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In the moment, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall all, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So you see how there's the salvation when we believe on Jesus Christ. The Spirit is that first fruits. That's why we can be called the sons of God. Because even though our body is not yet a son of God, it's still that sinful flesh, that sinful son of Adam. That's why 
the Bible tells us in First John, a whole manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God because we're technically not fully a son of God yet. Romans 8, there's still this redemption of our body that the Bible talks about. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. See, so this is this coming when we're at the resurrection, right? When we're given a new body, that's the manifestation of the sons of God. Because right now, you can't see the son of God. It's the spirit. Right? What you're seeing is the son of Adam, sinful flesh. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who had subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage. See how it's talking about the actual physical creature, like our body. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. You say, why do I get pain in the back? It's because your flesh. Right? And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. All right, so there's this redemption of our body that we are waiting for, which is the resurrection. Philippians 3, look at this. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself all right so let's look at the journey of the believer right with this diagram so how does it work for a believer born spiritually alive they reach their age of accountability spiritually die then they make the decision to put their faith on jesus christ right so now their spirit is born again now, when they die and their soul leaves their body, and remember, notice see how the soul never changes. That's why I'm leaving it in white. When they die, their soul and spirit depart from their body, and because their spirit is alive, they are immediately in heaven. They live in heaven. That's why Jesus says, Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Right? But the body is still dead on the ground. Right? And one day, at the resurrection... We will be reunited with a new body, right? A sinless body. So now we'll be a son of God, both in spirit and in body, right? The soul is now fully a son of God, right? Because it has both aspects that are saved. This is why, you know, you don't want to misunderstand verses like in Romans 13, where salvation sometimes refers to the salvation of our body, right? When we believe on Jesus Christ, once we get the first fruits of the Spirit, we, we are saved. We can't lose salvation because once we get this, we are promised this. Right? So don't, don't think that, you know, just because the Bible talks about our salvation of our body, redemption of our body, our salvation is coming nearer, that, that doesn't mean you're not eternally saved already. It's just that we're waiting for this. But everybody who gets this will get this. Right? That's what's happening. So let me show you in Romans 13, verses like this, for example. Romans 13, verse 11, And that, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. So you might read a verse like that and say, what? I was already saved when I believed. Yeah, that is correct. You know, when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we're saved, our spirit's born again. But what is this referring to, right? This is referring to our, our full salvation, right? Because eventually Jesus is coming back. It's, it's coming closer. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in riding and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. So generally, you need to understand, see, when we're talking about salvation, we go out and preaching the gospel. We're talking about being born again of the, of the Spirit. But so there's more to salvation than that, right? That's all it takes to get saved, to start on that journey, right? And you will be on that journey because you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. But, you know, there's more to the plan that God has, right? Which is obviously, you know, one day the resurrection, you know, helping us to get rid of our sin, things like that. There's more to the Christian life than just receiving that first fruits. So just don't let that 
stumble you into thinking that salvation, you know, is, is by works or things like that. You just need to understand that God gets the process started and eventually it finishes. But everyone who believes on Jesus Christ will be on that journey, right? Now, what about the unbeliever? The unbeliever. Well, what happens to their body? Jesus says here in Matthew 10, 28, Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So now you understand the spirit and the body. I'll show you some of the diagrams, but you'll now understand why these verses have this. Because when somebody dies immediately and then their soul goes to hell, you say, well, their body didn't go to hell. Their body is still on the ground. Well, that's because it's not the end yet because there's going to be the resurrection later, right? In Revelation 20. So I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. So when this happens in Revelation 20 at the white throne judgment, there's nothing else that exists. Right? Heaven and earth flee away. We're all at the great white throne judgment. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And, they, and, the, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and, the de and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. So you see there, there's that resurrection of the dead, of the people, the souls coming out of hell, being reunited with their bodies. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So this is where, I believe, this is where hell is relocated, from the heart of the earth to the lake of fire, out of darkness. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So at this great white throne judgment, you have us there who are saved. We've already been resurrected. We're watching this. But we also will be rewarded according to our works. Right, The wood, hay, stubble, gold, silver, precious stones. This happens at the great white throne judgment too. But then you have all those people that were not saved and all the people that were saved after the resurrection also come to this great white throne judgment. This is why it says, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire because there are also people there that are found written in the book of life that aren't cast into the lake of fire. Right? But they're resurrected. This white throne judgment happens after the thousand years. So that's why there's a benefit to being saved prior to the thousand years because then you get to live throughout that thousand years ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ. But after that thousand years, everyone is resurrected. Those that are not saved will be cast into the lake of fire and then the rest live on, on the new heaven and new earth. Right? So this is the journey of the unbeliever. The unbeliever, born alive, like all of us, reaches the age of accountability, spiritually dies. Right? Now, because they did not believe on Jesus Christ, when they die, their spirit, like without, this body without spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Right? So then, because the spirit is dead, that's why the soul goes to hell. Okay? So this is why I believe the spirit is kind of key to life. Because right? it seems that the spirit is alive or dead. That determines whether your soul is alive or dead. And, and whether that's in the body, it determines whether the body is alive or not. Then at the white throne, they are resurrected to the same body, right? Because they don't, they don't have that, that promise, right? So they are resurrected to their same sinful body and their spirit is still dead. And this is why they then... Oops. So remember when Jesus said in Matthew 10, he's able to destroy both soul and body in hell? So that is referring to when they are cast into the lake of fire after being reunited with their body. So the white throne judgment, they're reunited with their sinful flesh and then whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And this is when they are destroyed, right, while well, suffering in hell, body, soul, and spirit. Okay, so this diagram helped me to sort of put down in a picture like what I'm seeing in my head when I'm trying to understand this. I hope this helps you as well because then when you're explaining these concepts, if you have this picture in your mind, it helps to understand how these interact together. So in closing, this is where we're at now as believers. You know, if you believe on Jesus Christ, you're born again, you have this struggle between the body and the spirit. Right? Your soul remains the same. So this is why people that are saved don't necessarily live right. It's unfortunate. 
But we don't want to change the gospel just because people don't do what God wants them to do. Right? The, the truth of the gospel is it's salvation by grace. You don't have to do any good works or keep any good works to stay safe. Right? But this is why it's possible for believers to be the same person they were before because they still have the sinful body. At least when they get saved, there's now the opportunity to serve another. Right? This is why God uses the, ma the marriage analogy because when we believe on Jesus Christ, we die with Jesus. The idea is we get a spirit, we're able to marry another, right? We're able to serve another. So that's why people that are saved don't necessarily live right. And if you understand this dynamic, it also means, um, hopefully it means, that you, that you don't doubt your salvation for the wrong reasons. Because sometimes Christians that buy into this whole, well, Christians won't do this, Christians won't do that, you know, and then they realize, well, I'm still doing the same things I was doing before. You know, I still struggle. I still have the same temptations that I had before. Why? Because of this. Does that mean you're not saved? No. Right? Because it's possible for those to be there. So you don't want to doubt your salvation because of the wrong reasons. Right? If you believe on Jesus Christ, if you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, you know, it's not me saying this to you. The Bible's saying you're saved. You know, whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You know, whosoever, Jesus, whosoever believeth in me hath everlasting life. That's a promise from God. That's not a promise from me. So if you believe that, that's how you know you're saved. You don't want to be doubting your salvation just because you struggle with the flesh. Everybody does. So understand the war within yourself. So then you take steps to overcome the flesh. So you don't want to be ignorant of this battle either and not do anything about it. There is a war going on within you. Make sure you walk in the spirit so that you don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you, for, uh, thank you for your grace. Lord, we thank you that even though we fail as Christians, that uh, we're still saved. We still have your love. You know, this is not a question, Lord, of whether you love us. It's a question of whether we're living a life that is pleasing, whether we're living a life that is of eternal value. Lord, help us to overcome the sins of our flesh. Help us not to just be comfortable dwelling in our flesh and having you know, the temptations and just saying, oh, you know, well, that's, that's how I am. Lord, let's uh, change. Um, we pray, Lord, that you'll give us the grace to do that. So we thank you, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.